I'm going to read two small sections of my book, The Flamethrowers. Uh, if, for those who haven't read it, um, all you need to know is that the, the narrator uh, is a young woman, very young, 22, who's just moved to New York City in the mid-1970s. And she wants to be an artist uh, and to get involved with the art world, but she knows no one there. And she's arrived and hasn't met anyone yet and is feeling pretty alienated by the city when she encounters um, two people in a bar who invite her to join them for a drink. Can everybody hear okay? Yeah, okay, great. This is my wife, the man said, Nadine. He said it again, Nadine, and looked searchingly at her. She ignored him as if she were used to this audible pondering of her Nadine-ness in bars for the benefit of strangers. We were at a wedding, Nadine said, turning to me. They asked us to leave. They asked Thurman to leave, I mean. But I don't like weddings anyway. They make my face hurt. That was how she spoke. Why did they want you to leave, I asked, but I could sense why. Something about their presence in an empty bar, many levels below what the man's clothes might suggest. Because Thurman lay down in the grass, Nadine said. He started taking pictures of the sky, just blue sky, instead of the bride and groom. He'd had a few too. I did not have a few too. I was looking for something decent to photograph, something worth keeping for posterity. Oh, posterity, Nadine said. Sure, great, if you can afford it. You could have just told Lester you didn't want to be the picture taker. There was a camera sitting in front of him on the bar, an expensive looking Leica. You're a photographer, I asked him. Nope, he smiled, revealing a tar stain between his teeth. But the camera, I couldn't think of how to say, you have a camera, but you aren't a photographer. I sensed he would only keep meandering away, like something you're trying to catch that continually evades your grasp. Better to say yes, Thurman said, and then disappoint people. I mean, really let them down. Lord knows you're good at that, Nadine said. I'm talking about building a reputation. So am I, she said. All I want, Thurman said, is for people to stop asking me to come to their weddings and funerals. I don't mind funerals, Nadine said, except when they buried my daddy in a purple casket. That was awful. She turned to me. Thurman knew my daddy. Daddy was a mentor to him, a teacher. A mentor, I repeated, hoping this might lead somewhere to some explanation of who she and Thurman were. Because they were someone or something, I was sure of it. Well, my daddy was a, I guess you could say pimp. Pimp is acceptable. I mean, now that he's dead, and you know what? People don't say procurer anymore. Who knew what was true about them? And my mother was a whore, so they got along perfectly. Probably nothing was true, but I liked the challenge of trying to talk to them. I had spoken to so few people since arriving that it felt logical to interact in this manner. It was direct and also evasive, each in a way that made sense to me. May he rest in peace, Thurman said. A gentleman. I wanted to ask him for your hand in marriage. You were 14 and god damn. I wanted to just marry the pants off you. He grinned and showed the ugly stain on his teeth. But then there was no point who wasn't marrying to get in your pants since you were allowing it. 
Nadine frowned. Do you want a purple casket, Thurman? Because Blossom might have one all picked out for you with a copper millennial vault to preserve your... He'd gotten up, walked to the end of the bar, and aimed his camera at a sign above the register. Sorry, no credit. Three or four drinks in, still, they hadn't asked me anything. But what interesting thing did I have to tell? I was content to listen to their stream of half reports on people I'd never heard of, stories I could not follow, one about a baby named Koch. This lady was nursing him, Nadine said, and then another lady, and you begin to think, wait a minute, whose baby is Koch? I don't know who was his mother and who was a wet nurse. I'll make you a wet nurse, Thurman said, as he grabbed Nadine and put his hand between her legs. She twisted away, and then she was prattling about a McDonald's she once went to in Mexico. I had been in a McDonald's commercial when I was in high school, and I thought, as Nadine spoke, that it might be a story I could share with them. McDonald's is supposed to be the same everywhere, right? Well, not in Mexico. They Mexicanize it. Hamburguesa con chile, no fries, frijoles. I was with my ex. We were starving, and I was ready to eat beans. We're at the counter and find out we have no money. He'd lost his wallet. She went on about this ex, the revolution he'd been fomenting that never took place and had led to their harsh and vagrant life in the mountains of northern Mexico, the hole in his pocket that his wallet wriggled through, leading to his inability to provide for her the most fundamental thing, a McDonald's hamburger. After which she left him and went to Hollywood, where the nightmare really began, a series of episodes and hard luck that involved rape, prostitution, and an addiction to Freon, the gas from the cooling element in refrigerators. What you get, Thurman said, for marrying a motherfucker. I don't want to talk about him, and don't call him that, would you? You brought him up. Only to tell her about the Mexican McDonald's. I was in a McDonald's commercial, I said. Oh, you're an actress. No, I just did the one thing. I was 16 and it was something, an ad our coach answered and Thurman, she's an actress. Well, I, we did act, I guess, but that's not, they needed a girl who could ski and so I, you're an actress and a skier? I never meet anyone who skis. Do you ski, I asked, only vaguely hopeful. Do I ski? No, honey. The commercials director and crew had come to Mount Rose where we trained. They talked to our coach and ended up choosing me and a racer named Lisa, a quiet girl no one really knew. There was a long day of takes and retakes. They wanted two girls with hair flying, snow bunnies on a brisk sunny afternoon. A week later, they flew us both to Los Angeles to a strange McDonald's in the city of industry where they only filmed commercials. It looked like a regular McDonald's with cashiers in paper hats, a menu board, the plastic bench tables where Lisa and I sat across from each other and smiled as if we were friends, although we weren't, each of us holding a hamburger in our fingers with hot lights on us in this fake restaurant that looked real except they didn't serve customers. I tried to explain this to Nadine, but she kept interrupting me. When we finished shooting the ad, I flew home to Reno. Lisa was supposed to be on the flight, but she wasn't. She was 18, an adult, and I didn't wonder. She had apparently gone to a bar near the fake McDonald's in the city of industry. No one ever heard from her again. Freaky, Nadine said. There's no telling. Once I met the serial killer, Ted Bundy. Can you believe it? 
He was real handsome, real smooth. I was on a beach, and here comes this hunky college guy. I was this close to ending up like that gal in the commercial with you. It had never occurred to me that Lisa had been murdered. I assumed she'd been impatient to meet her future and had just fled into it and never bothered to let anyone know where she was. I miss Los Angeles, Nadine said. Don't you? I was only there for one night, I said, in the city of industry, which I don't think is technically even Los Angeles, and so the way the palm trees shake around, she went on, and it sounds like rain, but everything is sun reflecting on metal. I once went to a house in the Hollywood Hills that was a glass dome on a pole, its elevator shaft, belonged to a pervert bachelor and he had peepholes everywhere. He was watching me in the toilet. Same guy drugged me without asking first. Angel dust. I was on roller skates, which presented a whole extra challenge. Thurman was laughing. I understood she was his airy nonsense maker, a bubble machine, and occasionally he would be in the mood for that. How the hell did you manage? Drugged on skates, he asked her. Like I said, there was an elevator. Anyhow, there's some use in being doped against your will. Before it happened, I didn't have my natural defenses. Some people don't get the whole boundaries thing until they've had their mind raped by another person. It helped me to establish some kind of minimum standard. She turned to me. Did you see Clute? Yeah, I said I did. I, I liked it, she said. He didn't. She gestured at Thurman. She wasn't curious what I thought of Clute, but that very film had been on my mind, this portrait of a woman who was alone and isolated in the dense and crowded city. In my empty apartment, I'd been thinking of the scenes where her phone rings. She answers and no one is there. Um, I'm just going to read a, one more smaller, shorter section. This is later in the book. Um, and the narrator, she doesn't have a name. She's from Reno, so a couple people call her that in the book. Is She's at a dinner party with um, a bunch of much older artists. It's being hosted by two artists, the Castles, their married couple, and everyone is trading stories um, about what they did over the summer, because it's New York City in the art world, and so people don't stay in New York in July and August. <clears throat> the Castles had spent the summer in East Hampton, although apparently Stanley never stepped foot on the beach. He slept all day and spent his nights drinking and making monologues on a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder Ronnie asked if he could hear a bit of one of Stanley's recorded reels. We ate our dinner silently, listening to Stanley's recorded voice. Without clothing, nudity loses context, it declared as the tape wound forward, one large wheel tracking the other. And yet to give the body partial context, a belt around the waist of a naked woman, a bow tie on a naked man. You see what I mean. Accessories take away nudity's dignity. Cheapen it. I know a man, a husband, whose wife enjoyed playgirl calendars. Each year she bought one and tacked it up in her area of the loft. Oh, this is taking place in a loft, I forgot to say that she and the man shared. Each month offered a different theme, a doctor nude with stethoscope and lab coat, a logger in red wing boots and a hard hat, an enormous dingling hanging down between his thighs. I don't know what the Dutch equivalent for dingling would be. Good. The wife was always careful to turn the calendar to the new month as if the previous one had not been enough of an imposition on this poor husband she lived with, 
who suffered enough as it was from unknown causes. One day the husband decided he'd reached his limit. He took the calendar down and removed all the genitals with scissors. He put the calendar back up on the wall, careful to return the page to the proper month, the model's genitals, previously outsized and healthy, now a jagged absence, a peak of wall from underneath, as if the nude model himself had forgotten to include his own dick and balls, or had lost them someplace, or had them taken from him in some unwholesome arrangement where he'd bet them or traded them away and had to suffer the consequences, posing without a crotch area. The wife said nothing about it, and yet in the way she proceeded, as if nothing were amiss, the husband knew he had deprived her. This made him happy for a while, but it wasn't enough, this husband discovered. Calendars were only a touchstone for the endless fantasies that were doubtless running through his wife's mind, and he could not get in there with scissors to remove them, and so he cut the cord on his wife's personal massager. That was what she called it, but we can say vibrator. Vibrator. But I've digressed from the original subject of partial nudity, which is what I aim to discuss. I'm not the first to point out its tasteless nature. Diderot said something about the consequences of putting stockings on the Venus de Milo, which brings me to another related matter, her limblessness, so obviously part of the allure. It would be unthinkable kitsch to fit the Venus de Milo with arms. Her missing limbs are a positive attribute, not an absence really quite strange as a concept. I once knew a man who played a hanky-panky with his wife that involved pretending she was an amputee. She would strap her lower leg up behind her thigh with his assistance and go around in a knee-length skirt and crutches hopping on the one serviceable leg. And people assumed she had lost the other one in a terrible accident or an illness of some kind. The two of them would have these erotic weekends in towns where no one knew them. They would pick a place on the map and arrive in their respective play act roles, a stoic amputee crutching her way into a motel office with the help of her doting caretaker. They would check into their room and then go to a restaurant where they received looks of shy condolence from the hostess and waiters and the other clientele. They would order as if they were on some kind of significant date, an anniversary, say, in these Hickville special occasion establishments where the waiter comes to the table with a pepper grinder that's five feet tall. You know what I mean. Heavy and oversized furniture, ugly American colonial lighting, either too bright or too dark, places where the wine is some kind of grapey burgundy served in a carafe by small-town goobers trained by the management to congratulate you on your order. Excellent choice, sir. As they ate their chops and drank their burgundy and took in the shabby ambience, the husband covertly fondled his wife's stump under the table, her not-real stump, her play stump, the two or even three carafes of burgundy staining in, blurring inhibitions, they would return to the motel. The man, drunk now and good and ready to get into the real business, would remain ever patient and solicitous with his handicapped wife, help her to the room, carry her over the threshold like a child bride being airlifted into a territory of freshness and anticipation the lightness of his wife's body in the man's arms, somehow exactly the weight of her light compliance. He would set her softly on the bed, proceed to undress her slowly with meaningful pauses and great care, eye contact, deep and even breathing, extra attention to her knee stump, the surface of it rounded but with shallow areas like a very smooth rock the knee, and then touching the cold bed below the knee, the emptiness of it, 
a complicated thrill, which I myself can only imagine, not for the lay person, was what this man said of their game, an advanced level of fantasy and humping. The idea of her missing leg was a shared space between them. It was practically a religion, and they didn't want to give it up. At the end of these dirty little weekends, when for the return home, she released her hidden leg, unstrapped it so that her stump was yet again just a normal healthy knee, the sight of it there in front of her was beyond painful for both of them. The real leg contradicted everything. It ground the memories of their romantic jaunts to nothing. The wife, her two healthy legs stretched out, would sob inconsolably all the way home. This distressed her husband, as you can imagine, and he had his own interest in hoping to find a solution to their problem. So they began to inquire. They saw various doctors at various clinics. Nobody was interested in helping them. One or two medical professionals even threatened to call the police, suggesting that the man could be arrested, which is another topic for another discourse. But briefly, why is the common good dependent upon preventing these two semi-free individuals from removing something that belongs to them and that they both agree must be disposed of? What interest do we have in her leg that she herself does not have, because I must confess I am among those who would want it to stay attached to the rest of her, even as this seems an abuse of governance, an imposition on the victimless sexual satisfaction of two people, as I said, semi-free. Last time I talked to this man, we have lost touch, the reason for which you'll learn in a moment. Anyhow, the last time I heard from him, he and his wife had finally found some kind of doctor down in the Yucatan who was willing to perform the operation. And apparently there was a community there for rehabilitation and general lifestyle support. They were planning to relocate. The man wrote to me and said, our dream will soon be coming true. And here I arrive at my point the point is that everyone has a different dream. The point is that it is a grave mistake to assume your dream is in any way shared, that it's a common dream. Not only is it not shared, not common, there is no reason to assume that other people don't find you and your dream revolting. After a pause, Stanley's recorded voice began to sing to us from the machine. So Stanley sings, so I have to sing this part. So this will be interesting with the acoustics. And I'm not a singer. Oh, dreams coming true in Quintana Roo, where we will cut off what's making you blue. We'll take it away, and you will feel whole. Oh, dreams coming true in Quintana Roo. Stanley got up and fast forwarded the reel. I'll stop right there. <laughs>